So, salam alaikum, very welcome to this session um, on the Pachanama, which, uh, as we can see, is, uh, is uh, drawing a substantial audience. My name is Francesco Orsini, and I teach at uh, SOAS in the University of London. Sound? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear both? Okay. Uh, so, I'm not sure if so, mu so much light is going to make it possible for you to see the pictures, actually. Um, and I'm afraid we don't have bigger screens here, so uh, this, is the, uh, this is the size of the pictures that you'll be able to see. So, very welcome. My name is Francesco Orsini. I teach at SOAS, the University of London, and I teach South Asian literature, so not art. But I was one of the happy people who went and saw the exhibition that uh, Emily Hannam uh, curated. So she's curator of um, Islamic and South Asian art at the Royal Collection of uh, uh, Buckingham Palace. Um, and she curated the exhibition at the Queen's Gallery of Buckingham Palace, uh, Splendors of the Subcontinent. Um, the publication of which Eastern encounters four centuries of paintings and manuscripts from uh, the Indian subcontinent is uh, being, uh, she's going to talk about tomorrow at the same time same in, this hall, uh, in this hall. So if you want to hear more about the other um, wonders in uh, the Queen's collection, come back uh, and hear about it. Uh, so. First of all, do you want to start, uh, Emily, Emily, to tell us what is the Pachanama and you, yes. who wrote it? Can everyone hear me? Is this loud enough? Or do you need to turn it up? Can you, can you turn my microphone up a bit, please? I'm used to shouting because <laughs> I'm a teacher, but... Uh, I'm not. I work in a library. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Is that better? Can everyone hear? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I'm so excited to be in Lahore. This is my first time. Um, and maybe I've only been here three days, and I've had such a warm welcome. Can we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pudge. <Pudge-hoo! laughs> Not too much. Okay, let's try again. The Pachanama, as many of you will know, translates as the Book of Empress. And the emperor in question is the fifth Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan, who you can see here. Um, and the Pajshanama was a book that he commissioned as history of his reign and his dynasty and a celebration of it. And the book we're going to talk about today has 42 beautiful illustrations. Um, but Shah Jahan, who you can see here, the modern equivalent of the Pajshanama would be as if a head of state, maybe the Queen or Donald Trump, in their own lifetime commissioned a biography of which they had full editorial control. Um, and they were able to sit down with the photographers and Photoshop and you know, digitally enhance their image um, so that this book projected their life and their worldview, and so it's a very heavily edited and controlled image. Um, and here we have Shah Jahan. Um, even in when he was a young man, a contemporary writer said of him that he was very serious and he never smiled. And actually, he was very rude to everybody. He had contempt for all, no matter what, rich or poor. And whether that was true or not, it probably is very exaggerated description. In all the portraits of Shah Jahan, we only ever see him in profile. So he has this very haughty air, almost a semi-divine image that he's projecting. And this is so you are never, when you're looking at an image of Shah Jahan, you never have eye contact with him. He is always aloof. He is always remote. Um, I think that's very important for, as, as a projection of his image. But he was the third son of em the Emperor Jahangir, and so there was n it was never certain that he was going to become the next emperor. Um, but as a prince, he had a very successful military career. Um, but after his father died, he murdered his three nearest rivals for the throne. But then he set about turning 
the Mughal Empire into this very successful military and bureaucratic machine. Um, and so he was able to fill the imperial treasury with huge amounts of land re revenue, um, which is why he became so wealthy. Um, and so this great commercial success actually meant that this period in South Asia was actually remarkably peaceful. And so often people who know nothing about South Asian history, just the name Shah Jahan conjures up this idea of you know, unprecedented wealth and majesty and splendor. But there's a lot more to him than that, which people you know, never really um, consider. But towards the end of his life, a major concern for him was how he was going to project his image for future generations and what history would make of him. And so he had his historians write this chronicle of his reign. So it's every day, every week of his life is recorded. Um, and this is what the Padshah is. I think lots of different versions were written during his lifetime and he edited them and then others he gave to princes and nobles. But the official copy was written by a historian from Lahore called Abdul Hamid. Um, and it took him 12 years to write. And he was paid 24,000 rupees for this. Um, and it, the final copy was three volumes of text. So each of the volumes covers 10 years of the emperor's reign. And he actually died whilst writing it. Um, and so the final volume was finished by his student, a, a man called Muhammad Baris. I mean, you say that, um, so the emperor edited it. Do you have any sense of, uh, from maybe other, other histories or other copies of what was uh, left out or what was um, uh, emphasized? <laughs> so, well, an important thing was that he, um, he changed the dates. So originally it was written in Allahi years, and then so mm. he changed it okay. um, to his renal year. Um, it was very much, he wanted it based on the history of his grandfather, the Emperor Akbar. Um, so he actually grew up in Akbar's court. Um, and so when he was young, he would have been very familiar with um, Akbar's historians. Mm. Um, so he wanted, and so very much wanted it based on that history mm. rather than the history of his father, um, the Jahangir Nama, which was more of a diary of the emperor. Yes, um, yes. So this was actually something quite different. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I mean, Abdul Hamid Lahori was a, was a poet. I mean, is there a lot of poetry in the, in the text? Yes, there, mm -hmm. is, <coughs> there is. Um, and often in our copy, uh, some of this um, poetry will be written in gold ink rather than mm. black or red for the rest mm. of the text. Okay, I hope we can see some, <laughs> of, uh, some of that. So, um, so why is the royal collection copy so important and, and worth talking about it now? So this is an image of the binding of our copy in the library. So the volume we have is actually only the first volume of the Pajanama, so it only covers the first 10 years. And it's so important because it is the only surviving imperial illustrated copy. So this is the only um, book of the Pajanama that survives from Shah Jahan's own time. Mm -hmm. And, and can you talk us through the manuscript? Yes. <coughs> well, oh, no, is it under? Um, the other really important thing about our manuscript is the scale of it. Um, so the size is this big. So it's, big. Huge, it's an enormous mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you just, it takes two hands to turn each of the pages. Mm -hmm. And when you feel it, the you know, the smoothness and the um, the high quality of the paper is really testament to this as mm. such an important object mm -hmm. rather than just a book. So the text is written on very, very ha um, fine, handmade, gold-flecked paper. And the 44 illustrations are really some of the finest mogul paintings in existence. And you know, we describe mogul paintings as miniatures. These are this big. These are not miniature by any means. Mm. Um, but it's a period where because of the amount of money that Shah Jahan had to invest in his artists, um, they could spend months and months and months on a single painting. And so the high quality of these paintings was never repeated. And the, despite working within very strict controlled environments, they still had 
a, a level of artistic freedom that w I don't think we saw, have seen before or after. Um, Can you give us an example of what you mean by artistic freedom? Well, we w as we'll there. show that okay. as we go right. along. Mm. Um, I want to give you an idea of what it's like to work through this manuscript. Um, and I am so aware that an image will never, ever recreate the feel of actually having and holding a work of art. And that's so true of the Pajanama um, and mobile paintings in general, because particularly the use of gold, gold leaf and gold paint, um, which when you're looking at, when you're holding it in your hand, the effects of the light really has such a strong impact on your mm -hmm. experience of viewing the manuscript. And so our Pajanama manuscript opens with this absolutely dazzling double page of illumination and that really sets the scene for the whole viewing experience of this book. Um, now the Shamsa is a really common opening for a royal Islamic manuscript and it represents divine light. Mm. Um, and so these extraordinary sunbursts, this like exponential structure, um, it really represents the unity, the infinity and the harmony of the divine, this indescribable beauty. But it also has a very specific royal connection. The idea of divine light that is passed or transmitted mm. directly from God to the emperor. And so it has this dual um, religious and imperial mm -hmm. symbolism. Um, and these two examples are, as I said, enormous, but also um, exceptional for the extraordinary high quality and craftsmanship that went into them. Um, in the bottom right corner, you can just about see the compass needle of the artist who, as he was um, sketching out and making mm. the geometric forms. Um, but when you look at this in real life, you can see that the artist has used not only different tones of the pigments, but different... Um, he's mixed different metals with the gold to give gif different tones. Some areas he's left um, unburnished, so mm. matte, and then some areas are very, very highly burnished to catch the light. And because gold is a very malleable pigment, they're also able to use a blunt needle to manipulate the texture of the paint, mm. which you know, when you look at it with the naked eye, you can barely, barely see. And then when you look under the microscope, you can see the extraordinary level um, of refinement and effort that has gone into making, when you look at this, this is an extraordinary visual hmm. experience um, that you just, it's so, so difficult wouldn't, to they comprehend. they wouldn't have looked, used a lens to, I mean, you think... Well, you know what, I don't know how it. useful a lens is when right. you are painting. No, but, but when you look at uh, the Shah Jahan no, or not, others, necessarily. not necessarily. They may have, they had lenses. Mm. Mm. Um, but it was really more the overall oh, the effect yes. uh -huh. of mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. total awesomeness. Mm. Um, now, what I want to do is take you through some of the paintings in the manuscript. So after this double shamsa, um, we have this frontispiece, um, an illuminated frontispiece, which is interesting because usually in an Islamic manuscript, this is where you would have a text preface, like a dedication, um, a blessing. But here, straight away, we have this double portrait. On one side, we have Taimur, who was the great ancestor of the Mughals, um, and Shah Jahan. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at it closely, you can see that the image is of Taimur handing over the Taimurid imperial crown to Shah Jahan. So a really important part of the Mughals um, in a case for their legitimacy in India was their um, relationship, their genealogy, genealogy going back to Taimur. And the introduction to the Pajnama is actually a long discussion of Taimur and all his descendants all the line straight down to Shah Jahan. Mm. So that's why this image is so important. Um, and you can see actually on the right, the painter of the Tamil portrait is really consciously historicizing the image um, compared to on the left, Shah Jahan, even the throne, everything is that more elaborate and you know, we would say maybe more Baroque. Um, whereas Tamil has this more you know, stiff, um, sort of um, as I said, historicizing look. 
it's also important to note again that Tamor is in three-quarter profile, whereas Shah Jahan is in this strict profile. Um, now, the paintings in the manuscript all depict very different, important, significant events in Shah Jahan's life. And these include lots of images from before he became emperor. So here we have a scene from 1617, and he's just returned from a successful military campaign in the Deccan. Um, and his father, Jahangir, is presenting him with a turban ornament. I think we have a detail. So you can see, so here you can see this is exactly the same sort of thing that we saw in the previous portrait. Um, this is a, sim a symbolic transmission of power in which the turban ornament um, represents that almost like a crown would in um, European society. But it's really interesting because, as I said earlier, there was no certainty that Shah Jahan would become emperor. But in all of the images in the Pajnama, we have this image that he you know, was crown prince and that this was you know, um, a, a definite, um, when actually the relationship between father and son was very fractious. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in 1622, Shah Jahan rebelled for six years. Um, and so again, this is you know, very much fake news, mm -hmm. editing what, um, you know, what history was going to... Um, was going to make of him. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to this main image. Um, because although this is a painting depicting an event that took place in 1617, it was painted much later and conforms to a lot of the compositional formulas that Shah Jahan um, period painting is really known for. And that's this very strict hierarchy um, in the painting that really reflects how Shah Jahan saw his place in the Mughal state. So the emperor always sits at the top in the center. And then the nearest people to him are the most important people at court. And so the further you are away from the emperor, the least important you are. And that really reflected the um, court ceremonies. Mm -hmm. um, but it was you know, made very visually explicit mm -hmm. in these paintings. Um, Yes, that's right. So you know, images of especially Jesus and Mary mm -hmm. are quite common, well, were quite common in wall paintings, and we see them in the Pajanama paintings as well. And that's, um, in some ways, both Jahangir and Shah Jahan saw themselves as sort of almost messiahs. So Shah Jahan was born in the millennial year, um, and he later really saw himself as this like religious renewer and a reformer. Um, and so they definitely had these parallels with Jesus, with Isa and Mariam. Um, they had, they felt an affinity with her and a Mongol queen of their own ancestry oh, right. who was yes. also impregnated mm -hmm. by this divine light through her tent. And so there are all these parallels mm -hmm. between um, Jesus and Mary that crop up um, in the literature and in the paintings. But often people are surprised to see them there, but they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So this is the, a self-portrait of the artist of this painting. Um, and his name is Payag, which is written mm -hmm. on the folders. He's wearing this um, sort of wavy design on his textile. This is very fashionable Turkish textile, so it's a good look for him. Um, uh, but he's a really interesting artist. He was one of two Hindu brothers working for Shah Jahan. Um, and as you can see, his... Um, he really gets away from that traditional stiffness that you get um, that people think of when they think mm -hmm. of a mogul paintings, but also his the palette and tones that he uses are really important and quite unique. Um, for each painting, he chooses uh, tones that really reflect the and the sense of mood in the painting. So this is a flashback painting, a sort of memory, and so these um, almost jewel-like palette has it's almost like a dreamlike atmosphere. Um, but when we see later in his other paintings, it completely changes. And that's mm. something that people, I don't think, really think about the, ch the use of the mm. choice of color and how it affects the mood um, mm. in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, but a really important, uh, if I go back 
can see where he's standing just above the bottom left of the painting. Now, this is the first time in Mughal history that the artists actually inserted themselves into the image, and that's really important. But look at where he's standing. He's standing right on the periphery of the image. Um, and that's a really important message about how he felt about his status in comparison to the emperor. So the emperor would host almost daily um, meetings with his artists, his architects, his jewelers. Um, and so they had a very close relationship. But for the artists to bring themselves into the frame is actually quite an important statement. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that they were always on the periphery, or sometimes when they signed the work, they signed it directly under the balcony where the emperor's feet would be. And again, it's a, sort of a statement of humility. Um, Now, the next one I want to show you, this is um, a scene depicting one of the accession ceremonies of Shah Jahan. So his father died in 1627 in November, but his formal accession ceremonies didn't start until the next spring. So this is the Agra fort. Um, and on the right, you can see we've got a similar um, image to what we saw before. Um, again, very controlled in its composition. And at the top, let me see if we've got a detail. Oh no, I'll go back. Um, at the top, what's happening is Shah Jahan is receiving his three eldest sons. Um, and the text says that they each kissed the ground before him and gave him a symbolic offering of gold coins. But there's more to it than that because his father Jahangir had actually held these three sons hostage here in Lahore for six years before Jahangir's death. Um, and so the day before this ceremony was the first time that Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal had seen their sons in more than six years. Um, and there's actually a very beautiful passage about how they just spent the whole day just looking at them, thinking, oh my God, they're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but on the right of Shah Jahan is his youngest son, who is actually meeting his brothers for the first time here. So it's quite a poignant image. Um, Below the balcony, we have this really interesting allegorical painting, because this does not depict a real wall painting in the Agra fort, um, but it's almost like a little microcosm of how Shah Jahan wanted his state to be seen. So we've got the world, and then we've got two mullahs, and then two lions and a lamb lying side by side, and then this chain in the middle. So. The mullahs represent religious authority, and I said before, you know, Shah Jahan really saw that his reign was very much supported, but, or you know, he was going back to religious orthodoxy, and that was just how, what, uh, that supported his reign. The two lions and the lamb represent sort of universal harmony under this ideal Shah Jahani rule, um, and the chain in the middle with the bells that represents supposedly a real chain that hung from the Agra fort down to the river. And anyone across the whole empire could come and ring the spell to get the emperor's attention. And he was obliged to listen to their plight. So this is a representation of you know, the justice, the peace, and the religious authority that make up Shah Jahan's rule. And the gold throne in front, the platform, this is where um, Shah Jahan's chief mullah will come and read the Friday sermon in the emperor's name for the very first time. And from then, from there, that sermon will be spread across all mosques across the empire. And that is how all of the empire will know that there has been a change of rule. So that's a very symbolic um, gold platform as well. And I think I've included, this is a detail looking at it under the microscope. And so I wanted to give you a sense of, this is the hatching of the gold um, by the artist who's a bit chitter. Um, and it's just to give you a sense of, you can't see that when you're looking at the page, but you know there's something amazing going on because your eyes um, you know, have this amazing experience. Um, but this is what, when you're looking in exhibition catalogues, what you're looking at paintings online, this is what you can't see. And that's why handling works is so, so important um, when you're studying this material. Um, now, this is the left-hand side of the composition. It's by a different artist called Ramdas. And what we've got, um, we've got all the imperial mace bearers 
And then above them, you've got um, a group of musicians high on the wall of the fort. Um, and they're playing their music really loudly. Also, they're there to, because these ceremonies went on and on and on. Um, and so you needed some musical accompaniment just to keep people awake. <laughs> but also, you have the kettle drums banging, and this is how people outside of the fort know that the emperor is there, know that something important is going on. Um, and then in the foreground, you have imperial elephants and horses being brought as gifts. But again, in this painting, we have a self-portrait of the artist. So he's the figure, if I go back, um, on the very left behind the guy in yellow. And here he is. And you'll see that he's actually signed his name in Devanagari script. Mm -hmm. um, so his name is Ramdas, another Hindu artist. Um, but I thought it was interesting that he chose to sign his name in this way when he knew that the painting would be presented to the emperor. Um, but you can see as well the figure just above um, the one in yellow, his eyes are looking out. And this is again quite rare and unique for this period of Mughal, Mughal painting, the idea that um, the figures are breaking the fourth wall and interacting with the viewer. Um, and you spot them every so often in the paintings, and I think they're really fun. Now, this is a painting that says, I am Shah Jahan, I am powerful, don't mess with me. Um, so, in the years 1630 uh, to 32, Shah Jahan's court moved south to the Deccan because that was where um, most of their military expansion was happening. Um, and during this time, one of his chief generals rebelled. And so this was a man called Khan Jahan Lodi. He was an ethnic Afghan who had been a very high general in his father's court. Um, but he didn't support Shah Jahan in his accession. Um, they had an all right relationship to begin with, but then he rebelled and he tried to get all the Afghan tribes um, to join him in his rebellion. But Shah Jahan sent his forces on him and they tracked them down and they killed him and his two sons um, and his entourage. And so this painting depicts the moment that after he's been killed, that his head is being severed to send back to the emperor as a trophy. And I want to look at it in some detail. So here we have, this is the lower portion of the painting. Um, and you can see that the Imperial Army formed this sort of semicircle around the head. Um, if you look closely, the figure in yellow is holding it by its ears um, while the other one cuts it off. Um, do I have a fine? And here's even more detail. Um, <laughs> it's like Caravaggio in its goriness. Um, uh, but you can see the extraordinary high quality of this painting and the um, lovely detail. The blood, we've done pigment analysis, and this is lac, which is um, an insect secretion. So this pigment is um, very tacky and has that really sort of gelatinous quality that when you look at it, it does look like blood. Um, Now this is the portion just above, and you see their little flies hovering around the severed heads. When you look at them under the microscope, they also have little dots of red pigment in their bellies as if they've been sucking the blood off the heads. Um, but for me, the interesting part about this is um, the leather of the horse's um, trappings. Um, that gold is punched with a very fine needle, so it looks like punched leather. You really get this beautiful effect. Um, and the red used for the velvet really has quite a, a sort of crystalline or like fluffy texture to give that sensation. Um, and here again, you can see in the detail, I don't, in the gold chain, you can see those punched dots. Um, So here's the center of the image, and you've got the two um, leaders of um, Shah Jahan's armies facing each other in a sort of symmetrical painting. And then between them is this figure who is probably the only one of Khan Jahan Lodi's sons who wasn't killed, who's being captured and being brought back um, to the emperor. And that, here's another detail. So you can see 
every single brushstroke that goes into the beard. And this is another detail under the microscope, so you can see the texture of the white pigment in making the feathers, so you've really got this wonderful um, texture on the page. Now, at the top of the painting, you have this really interesting outcrop with Shah Jahan's army. Um, and they're just chatting away, having fun. They're totally oblivious of the scene going on underneath them. Um, but the tree in the middle is a chinar tree. Um, and that was very much associated with um, the Timurid dynasty. It was a tree that they brought from their Mo Mongol heartlands down to India. Um, and so in this painting, that could be seen to represent the emperor who was absent but present. Um, now, the artist of this painting is the son of an Iranian. Ooh, here's another detail of the figures at the top. The artist of this painting was called Arbid, and he was the son of an Iranian migrant painter. Um, but it's so interesting that his work does diverge so much from his father's, which was in a very strongly classical Persianate style. Um, but you still have that Persian emphasis in the you know, solid blue sky and that solid block of gold on the top and the way the painting is divided into these three registers. Um, but you can definitely see that he's also looking at European paintings and the idea of realism in the work. You've got this amazing contrast in the one painting between the two. Um, and it really is a sensational painting in all senses of the word. It's completely unique. Now, here is another bit of fake news, because this is Shah Jahan um, in the Deccan receiving the Persian ambassador. So the Persians and the Mughals were great rivals. Um, uh, we know that the Persians thought that the Mughals really upped themselves for using the title Padshah um, rather than just Shah. Um, but this was the arrival of gifts from Iran. Um, to Shah Jahan to congratulate him on his accession. Um, and it happens in a tent just outside the hall of um, public audience. And in the middle, we have the emperor, surrounded by his sons. And you can see in all the pictures, he's got this halo. This is the Shams of the divine light that we saw at the beginning. Um, and here at the bottom, we have the Persian ambassador. And the <laughs> yes. we know that he arrived with a three lakhs of rupees worth of gifts and a huge entourage. Um, and it was very much a public statement of the wealth of Iran, giving these extraordinary gifts to the king. Um, and he would have certainly been received in a grand ceremony and brought close to the emperor. But here he is not only far away from the emperor, but you see this red um, barrier. He is on the outside of the barrier, so he's not even with the important nobles at court. He is so far removed, um, which certainly would not have been the case. Um, and here is his entourage bringing what look like quite measly gifts when we know in actual fact they were you know, extraordinary gifts. Um, and so Shah Jahan would probably look at this and had a good chuckle because... Um, Again, this is how he wanted the world to be perceived, not necessarily how it was. Do you think word would have gone back to Iran that you know they've depicted the scene? And, uh, <laughs> not necessarily. Uh, I mean, they weren't all uh, painted at the time. Yes, it wasn't yes, like yes. Um, you know um, reportage photography. Um, no, I think he would have probably kept this one <laughs> hidden from them. And again, in this painting on the left, we have a self-portrait of the artist. We don't know what his name was because he didn't sign it. But um, I particularly like this image of the artist because he's holding his folder. And it's this beautiful lacquer cover, um, which is quite similar to one that the book is in. Now, this is a painting that really suggests the power and might of the Mughal armies. Here we have the general Nasiri Khan in 1632. Um, and he is storming the most important stronghold in the Deccan. And so 
the capture of this fort, which was deemed completely impregnable, was really what allowed the Mughal armies to conquer the rest of the Deccan. Um, and it's by the same artist we saw at the beginning, Payag. But you can see, um, again, the tones are very different. We've got this, um, at the bottom right-hand corner, if it goes, we've got this wonderful patchwork of here's Nasiri Khan on his horse and the arms. And you see the um, imperial standards that the, arm, the soldiers are holding. In the middle... And some rabbits. And some rabbits. Yeah, I'm going to come back to the rabbits. Um, you really get a sense of the claustrophobia of the you know, complete, um, you know, this is almost like war photography from the Mughal period. You can really get a sense that he was on the battlefield and you, he wants to project the different makeup of the army, but also you know, I think you get a sense of the fear and uncertainty um, in these soldiers' faces again, looking out at the view, which is so rare. Um, in the background, you have an extraordinary image of um, the fort being stormed. You can't really see the detail. Um, but for me, one of the most amazing parts of this painting um, is this part which looks at the mines exploding um, in the fort. And you, you've got this sort of like matchstick figures of charred bodies. You see on the right, you've got this black figure falling. Um, from the fort, and then the bottom, I hope you can make it out, you've got um, this image of bodies, and on the left they are sort of red and raw and charred and burning, and as you go towards the right they turn more into skeletons, and so the idea of the body decaying, and then the, but the skeleton image are placed right beside the clothed, newly killed fresh bodies. And so you know, there's a real emotional response that the artist wants to this. You know, he's really looking at the great conquest, but also the very bloody, raw um, realism of war. Um, and I think the bunnies really at the bottom are um, to suggest this the emotional realism, you've got you know, these happy bunnies sitting at the bottom and this horrible, horrific scene going on, so he's really trying to play on your emotions, um, which is again something that people don't think of when we think of mogul painting. How are we doing for time? Shall I go quickly? Um, this is a wedding scene, because obviously weddings were really important occasions, um, an opportunity for the emperor to show off his pomp and splendor to as wide an audience as possible. Um, but this is Darish Ko's wedding. It was actually delayed due to Mumtaz Mahal's death. Um, and then it was Jahanara who organised the whole thing. And again, this is the image of Shah Jahan um, placing a veil of pearls and rubies over Darish Ko's head. Um, but the way that they're all framed, you've got these beautiful textiles underneath, you've got this extraordinary halo over his head. Um, the idea that the imperial image was so controlled, so framed to give this idea of extraordinary splendor. And at the bottom, what I wanted to touch upon was the idea, the fact that there are no depictions of Jahanara, of Mumtaz Bahal, of any of the imperial women in the Pajanama. What we do have are the dancing women, and these were not just dancing girls off the street, these were very, very high-class women who came for all the important imperial um, events and would sing and dance, and they, you know, they're dressed like mogul princes because they had an extraordinary amount of wealth. Um, but it's important to say that you know, none of the imperial women were, are depicted. And again, we have a self-portrait of the artist here on the left, Bulaki. I don't think he's that great an artist. His faces aren't very good. Um, but his, the illumination is really brilliant. So I think he was probably more of an illuminator, maybe worked in textile design, as opposed to just a painter. Um, and it's important to think that these artists did do multiple things. Roles. Yeah. Um, shall we? Yeah. Are we doing? OK, yeah, time. Shall I carry on? Or shall we? Well, maybe um, if you can choose two more of, of okay. from the... Um, the next one I really wanted to talk about, ooh, I'll keep, go back, is this. So this is a 
painting that really is a statement about the strength and vigor of the Mughal dynasty rather than just Shah Jahan. And um, so on the left, we've got Shah Jahan on his horse. What's happened here is the imperial family have been watching an elephant fight from much further up the river. Um, this is Agra just before the monsoon, so this is the dried up river. Um, they're watching an elephant fight, but the elephants start running away. And so Shah Jahan calls um, some horses so that they can follow the elephants down. Um, and the further they get down the river, one of the elephants turns and starts charging at Prince Aurangzeb. And instead of running away, he holds his own um, and he you know, meets the elephant directly and spears him. Um, and in the book, we know that he spears him in the forehead. And you can just see on the top that the elephant has this big red patch here. But the artist, for that you know, emotional immediacy of the painting, has um, depicted him stabbing him in the trunk so that their eyes are on the same level. So it's as if they're having a um, face off. In the background of this extraordinary painting, we have all the foot soldiers who are um, throwing off these fireworks and you know, trying to repel the elephant, but it's not working, so they're all tripping over each other. And oh, the figure on the elephant at the I'll go back here, he's terrified. He's dropped a log, which, is ho which he'd hoped would trip the elephant over and make him stop, but it hasn't worked. Um, and so you know, he's got fear of death, life in his eyes. He thinks he's going to, about to have Aurangzeb's blood on his hands. Um, and here we have the emperor on the left. And it's interesting that he and the rest of the imperial family are depicted in this very sort of stiff, um, as if, and compared to the absolute chaos going around in the rest of this painting, the idea of the contrast between the steadfast emperor and his family um, amid everything that's going on. And the other interesting thing about this painting is it's the only one in the whole manuscript, firstly that's landscape, but also that depicts shadows. And so here we have shadows um, under the emperor and the rest of the painting, but the source of the light that's casting the shadow is the emperor and his halo. So again, it's the idea of the emperor being the sun on earth. Um, and this last one we can talk about um, is the only depiction in this volume of the Pajanam of the Lahore Fort. And you can um, see that the emperor and his sons have visibly aged. So this is Aurangzeb being received um, by Shah Jahan on his return from Adekhan. And on the left is Shah Jahan's father-in-law, Asif Khan, who's presenting a dagger to be given to Aurangzeb. Um, and this is an important one to finish on because, of course, Shah Jahan fell ill in 1658, uh, which was a catalyst for a war of succession between his sons. And again, it wasn't certain who was going to um, become the next king, although Shah Jahan's favourite was obviously Dara Shakoh. But it was Aurangzeb who imprisoned his father in the Red Fort and declared himself emperor. Um, but Shah Jahan survived for another six years living in the Agra fort. But the extent to which he had access to his artists and calligraphers is unknown. And so this copy of the Pajanama, the text was finished in 1657, so just before all these events took place. Um, and so what happened next, we don't know. So just before I open for uh, <laughs> questions for the, um, uh, you know, for the last 15 minutes, can you tell us a little bit how it came to the royal collection? Yes. <laughs> um, so as I said, what happened later is still quite vague. The borders of the text are actually 17th, uh, 18th century. Um, so at what time the whole manuscript was put together, we don't know. We know that in the 1760s and 1770s, a lot of the Mughal imperial libraries were ransacked, were looted, um, and were sold off. Actually, many of um, the Nawabs in the provinces, such as Asfadala here, they would collect Mughal imperial manuscripts, um, almost like in Europe you'd collect old master paintings. Um, and so Asfadala, living in Lucknow in the 1780s, he purchased this Pajanama, which had been looted um, from the imperial, probably looted from the imperial library. Um, he purchased it for 10,000 rupees. And when he died, um, his successor 
presented it to the Governor General at the time, Lord Taymouth, Sir John Shaw, who had supported his um, succession as the next Nawab. But Lord Taymouth actually turned it down. He was a great bibliophile and he'd never seen a manuscript like it. He said it was the finest thing he'd ever seen. But he knew how much Osvaldo had paid for it. And in East India Company rules dictated that if you received a gift, you could keep it, but only if you gave the monetary equivalent to the East India Company Toshakana. Um, and he wasn't prepared to do that because he didn't have the money. So he declined it, but suggested that it might make an appropriate gift to George III, the King of England. And so this manuscript and five others from the Lucknow Imperial Libraries, all great examples of the finest imperial paintings and calligraphy, these were packed up and sent to Calcutta and then onwards to London. And George III unwrapped them in Buckingham House, which is now Buckingham Palace. Um, and he knew the value of them and he made them publicly available in his library at Buckingham House. And the even more interesting thing for me is that when George III died, his entire library was presented to the nation and is the core of what is now the British Library. So when you go in, you see this huge stack of books in the middle of the building called the King's Library. Um, and that was George III's collection. But a few manuscripts were held back and all of his Indian collection was held back. And I think that's very significant that he, that the, um, at the time, they decided that these manuscripts were still fit for, and supposed to be in a royal library, not in the British Library. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now a few minutes for questions. Yes, one microphone. up there, if you can. Uh... Um, but I think it's difficult for us to gauge what the audience for it was at the time. So for a manuscript particularly like this, it would have actually had a very limited audience. Only the, those closest to the emperor would have been able to look at this. Obviously lots of copies were made and disseminated, um, but in terms of the unique imperial copies and the illustrated copies, I think we have to realise that they did have a limited audience. Um, and the equivalent for what we would think of as paintings of having a big audience, um, oil paintings in Britain, for instance, would have been the wall paintings that covered the palaces. So they would have been the paintings that everyone saw. Um, and I think there would have been a lot of overlap. I think a lot of, there would have been a lot of portraits. And we know that in some of the palaces, they did have, again, sort of lineages. So they had... Um, paintings of all the royal family, but also with, you know, Taimur and um, Babur and Humayun. Um, so I think you're definitely right, but we've got to think about the audience. No, actually, I oh. think we should probably leave it to somebody else. Yes, one here. Library at Windsor. Yep. All you have to do is email me or email um, on our on the Royal Collection website. Um, there is a, a little section that, and you can fill in. The, obviously, we can't let absolutely everyone in the whole world come to the Royal Library to see the question armor just because we don't have the spatial capacity or the number of people um, to supervise that. But if you are a researcher, if you have a genuine reason rather than just, oh, I'd like to see it, then, then of course we make the physical thing publicly available. But what we are in the process of doing is digitizing the whole manuscript. So at the moment, images are online. Um, I hope that in the next few years we will have a turn the pages virtual reality of the whole manuscript. So when you're bored on your lunch break, you can go online and then you can zoom in super high resolution and have a look at these images to your heart's content. Um, and that's important as well for, you know, here in Lahore at the NCA, 
such an important part of the um, practice of learning how to paint in traditional style is by copying and copying and copying. Um, but unless you have really, really high resolution images, you don't get that sense of um, the paintings. Yes, one question there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, there is a lot of overlap. Um, they definitely had different tastes. So we have very, so whereas in Jahangir's reign, we have lots of natural history paintings that we don't really get in Shah Jahan's um, reign. But the, um, uh, the allegorical paintings, which I haven't shown so much, but yes, Jahangir really started that. And we do get exactly the same sort of allegorical images during Shah Jahan's reign. Um, but also because there was an overlap with painters. So a lot of the painters in Jahangir's period were inherited by Shah Jahan. Um, so, does that slightly answer your question? But also, we get, I think, the Ebercock has written a lot about how um, the image is so much more codified in Shah Jahan's reign that you have these very structured um, compositions that, you know, all the Durbar scenes are the same. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, without, without his contribution, we wouldn't have these. There was a question. We don't know if they were ever even written. Because, so, as I said, this copy was finished in 1657, so just, so just before everything happened. So whether the calligrapher, um, Mahad Amin of Mashhad, whether he ever completed the second two volumes, we don't know. They certainly don't survive. So they're not even copies? We got no. non-illustrated no. copies no. of the other volumes? Do we have a plan to return this? To who? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a question. Yeah. It's strange to hear the Pachanama being referred to as the Pachanama with a pay, with the letter pay, yeah. uh, yeah. with the phoneme pay, because by now Urdu goes with the Arab Arabic bay. Uh, so and so is it because, uh, I'm assuming because the Mughal uh, court of the time was more Persianate uh, and less Arabic. Uh, and then also, Secondly, um, how much of uh, all of this art was inspired by contemporary European art? Because a lot of the illuminated manuscript, manuscripts and the, the materials, the mediums, the gold, it looks like it's drawn from cross-cultural inspiration and influence. Yeah. I'll let you answer the first question. But you do get Bacha also at the time, so yeah. it's not, you know, Pacha and Bacha, I think you find both. You can refer it to it however you want. Um, the second question, yes, there were definitely more um, monochrome prints, um, but also oil paintings that were coming from Europe at this time. And we know that from all the mogul copies of them that the artists made. Um, yeah, there's a huge amount of overlap, and there's a lot of literature on that. I can send you afterwards if you like. Thank you. Do we know where exactly was this uh, work executed? No, we don't actually. Um, probably, Agra, but uh, you know, we know that Shah Jahan Khan's court was very peripatetic, and so whether the artist travelled with him and his court, we don't know. But these paintings were produced over a period of 30 years. They weren't all just painted at one time. So no, uh, it was not typical. In only one or two paintings do we have the artist sign their name and where they painted it, mostly Agra. Thank you. Just to sort of build on it, uh, I'm curious if this document had a very limited audience, who was it intended for? Yeah, that's my question. Um, the book itself had a limited audience. The text itself definitely was um, propagated around the whole empire. So, But how many people could read and write? You know, it's a certain level of society. I think he... The Pachanam obviously was modelled on the Shahnameh, the Persian Book of Kings, and so it was more him thinking that he needed something that would stay in the imagination, that would be passed down through the generations. Uh, I, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think uh, in 
like with the Safavids, with the Mughals, I mean, having illustrated books uh, was part of what made you a, a king. You know, that was a big king. And, and whether you took, you could, I mean, we have records of when, you know, um, histor historians like John Seiler have worked on, you know, the librarians and the libraries and the fact that they did take them out and look at them and put them back. And every time that was actually recorded when the emperor took the book out and and saw it, and then the seals that the librarians would also, you know, go and check them periodically. So, I think that was, I mean, if we think of all, all the other things that they also had made, you know, buildings and this, jewels, and yeah. you know, this was one <laughs> of the many things that you had to have if you were a, a great yeah. king. Um, but the style of this is extremely flowery, poetic language. It's not at all accessible. So actually, even within Shah Jahan's lifetime, an abridged version of the Pajjanama called the Shah Jahan Nama um, was written to make it more accessible. So you are you are the last of the Pajjan who are making it accessible. Mm, it's a royal library, isn't it? Yeah, it's a royal library. So yeah. you know, that's, uh, you know, even today you'll you make a book and then you'll make make a presentation copy for you. Right, last uh, question, anybody? <laughs> okay, <Anyone else>? right. <laughs> we'll give you the last question. Were they, made, were they made by the same painter or were they made by someone else? Who? Well, these paintings weren't necessarily made for this exact manuscript. So these are paintings that were made by artists depicting contemporary events at court, not necessarily for this exact manuscript, although the events depicted match the events in the manuscripts. So that's why other Shah Jahan period paintings, often people say, oh, this is from a missing volume of the Pachanama. No, it wasn't. These are just paintings all from that period of time, which depict contemporary events which are written about in the Pachanama, but there's not necessarily a connection between this exact manuscript. Well, thank you very much, Emily. That's been a... I don't, I don't work with art and I always find that looking at pictures with uh, art historians is a different experience and the things they, that you pick up and concentrate are, you know, you, you train our eyes. So thank you very much and come and hear her tomorrow again.